Yeah, it, it's of course a, a great pleasure to be here, and I really appreciate that Habib took the initiative to do a thing like this, uh, which is often not done. Often it is indeed hundreds of people, and generally speaking, a, a uni directional communication. So you have lectures, and that's it. Uh, but this year, I think, is is a, a wonderful opportunity. Um, I didn't select the title myself. It was kind of handed over to me by whoever, Josh or whoever. Josh, yes, Josh. Um, so, um, so I thought, okay, so that's what they would like to learn about. And therefore, I'm going to start a little with, with where I come from in, in uh, Bonus and, and Siemens and what we did in offshore. And we did this project as our first try back in 91, uh, the world's first uh, Vinneby at uh, Lolland, 11 450 kilowatt turbines. A, a, a very big challenge actually, because since nobody had done an offshore wind farm before, it was an obvious question, well, how do you do it? How do you actually design the turbines so that they are marinized? How do you actually go about it so that it makes sense? And how do you install them, for that matter? Um, and uh, after a lot of <coughs> deliberations, we came to the conclusion that um, we needed what is nowadays called a C5 high offshore protection. That's kind of an, like a no-brainer. But that we needed to have the machine completely enclosed. So the machine would need to be cooled with heat exchangers so that it could be completely encapsulated and then have dehumidifiers on the inside so that it could always be <coughs> below 60% relative humidity. Because 60% is the threshold for corrosion of steel. So if you took a piece of steel that would immediately corrode out in a marine environment and left it here on the table. As long as we had less than 60% humidity in here, it stays nice and shiny and appetizing. Uh, we also built a, uh, made a building crane and we made a transportable crane so that we could have a big crane that could be installed with a small crane and could be used for main component replacement. And that was about it. In those days, uh, turbines were always open, so the thing about having them completely enclosed was, was new to us, at least. Um, and on inst installation, there were no proper vessels available to us to do this at the time, because, of course, there were big vessels for the North Sea, but they couldn't operate in the Baltic where this project was installed. So we actually did it in, in, uh, by cheating, because our, our um, usual supplier of, of installation work had the sort of lead crane guy and we wanted this lead crane guy by the name of Life to do the installation. So we simply said to Life, Life, we're going to run you onto a barge and it looked kind of different but just pretend that all the blue is green. Then it's like an everyday <laughs> at, at work and, uh, and he did that. So we installed them all uh, from a, a floating barge. So floating to a fixed foundation and it worked because it is uh, a shallow water site. And the experience, now the project has been running, we had to start a production on the 11th of July 1991, so it has operated for a bit over 24 years. And the experience is that lastly the modifications were what in my childhood mathematics was called necessary and sufficient. In other words, they did the job and you could live with not having more than that. And there was one thing that was a, 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 a dismal failure, and that was the big portable crane. It worked, but it was a monster, and we hated it, and it was used once to replace a brake disc and then never again. And since then, regularly, on all the subsequent projects, people came and said, oh, we need a big crane we can install. So at the next project, Middelgrunden, we actually built that big crane. And they had it and was lying on the key side for 15 years or 10 years or whatever, and then was scrapped. And on the next project, they said, we want this big crane. We said, you don't want it. And they said, we want it. We said, we will build it for you. But before we place it on the key and look stupid, you come over and we try it on the turbine. And your people try to install it on the turbine and take it out again. And then we figure out whether you want it or not. So they paid for it. And we did the test. And of course, they didn't want it. So big cranes, forget it. This was the second project, Middelgrunden 2000. Uh, the first with, uh, that we did with megawatt turbines. And um, it had one change from Windeby, and that was at this stage we had uh, developed the condition monitoring system. 
And that became a key parameter of big projects. Um, actually, it did not play a big role at Mittelgrunden. It's operating now in the 15th year. Uh, we never had a crane out there, so touch wood. But, uh, but that, that is kind of like a, a very good success story. Uh, installed with a, a jack up crane picking up equipment from a floating barge, installing it on a fixed foundation, not a good solution. Because when you, even though you are in shallow waters outside Copenhagen, you have ship traffic and you get uh, waves, and then you don't want to have a fixed crane and a floating barge with your equipment. Samsø 2002, 2.3s, uh, our first project with monopiles at the exorbitant depth of 18 meters. The earlier projects had been, had been uh, um, shallow waters up to 5-6 meters, here it was 18 meters, so we could no longer use the gravity foundations. Um, and then Nysted, this was kind of like our breakthrough project properly. Until then, offshore had always felt sort of, yeah, fine, but let's see. This was a 165 megawatt project, 72 2.3s. Uh, the first one we built with the proper equipment, jack-up vessels that could carry the turbines. Um, the only modification relative to earlier was that the lubrication systems were automatic and had 18 months capacity, so you can actually live for a year longer than the usual inspection interval, which is six months. And that gives us the redundancy that even if you are delayed on service, um, you, uh, <coughs> you uh, um, uh, don't mind letting the turbine uh, keep on operating. Uh, it's operating now in its, uh, it was commissioned late 2003, so we are, are, are now in 12, 13 years on and they're running at very high availability. It is, has the questionable distinction of being the only offshore project that had a main transformer defect. So when I get involved with substations, nowadays they are very often made with redundant transformers, so two transformers that you can change over between. Actually, there was only one project, this one, that ever had a transformer failure. It took six months to correct. And then the real thing, uh, Anholt, outside, uh, uh, still in Danish waters, 400 megawatts, 111, 3.6s. If we take the capacity factors, Vindeby, 1991, 23%. Nysted, 2003, 38%. Anholt, 2013, 50 percent. I don't know if we'll get much higher than that. And then finally today, um, the uh, 6 megawatt, and this is a picture from from um, uh, Westermost Rough installing the 6 megawatts. One 6 megawatt does uh, in a year about 50 percent more than a Vindeby turbine did until now. So we have really progressed when it comes to to where we are. And the effect uh, of doing this approach has been good. This is uh, Siemens's market share in, in uh, 2014. And this is the overall accumulated market share of, of uh, the company through the life of the offshore industry. So when we sat down in 89, and the Danish government said, yeah, there's been a lot of talk of offshore wind power, now we're actually going to do it. And in bonus we said, we need the first. It actually worked. That is the conclusion. But what of course also worked was to have a healthy respect for what is out there. Because what is out there is very different from just an onshore wind farm put offshore, which some people believe. And during this long process we also did the first floater in 2009 with Statoil. Uh, a great success, still working. Um, Spa boy, as we all know. And there I had my my sort of uh, uh, not only first experience with floaters, uh, but also um, the the sort of hands-on experience about the appeal, which is I think a thing that I think greatly assists us if we can get our act together. And the real thing is that it is so attractive. We built in 2009 many hundreds of megawatts offshore. We contracted in 2009 
a London Array, 630 megawatts, still the biggest offshore project ever. And we built one single floater, 2.3 megawatts, and we had like twice as much PR and press on that thing as on all the other things put together. <laughs> so the appeal value, the sexiness of floating, simply is very, very high. However, um, there are significant challenges in what we are doing. <coughs> and seen from a manufacturer, floating is indeed very attractive um, because we expand our potential market so much. It's basically creating a completely new market compared to where we are now. Where we are now, we are in this little room placed on a big field. And if we can open the door, we have the whole field to play on. And we can even maybe save money on, on our main effort, which is like installing and commissioning turbines and so on, because if we do it right, of course, as we all know, we can do that at key site. However, <coughs> it is still much too expensive. And what we do is not well adapted to industrial manufacturing. And there I think we need to be honest to ourselves and say, if we do not correct that, we will, we will be discussing every second year if we are successful and with this and we like to come and visit Habib, we'll discuss every second year something that never progresses beyond prototypes and demonstrator projects. Five turbines here and there. And to be quite frank, and now we again get the, what Josh wanted, which was the OEM's perspective. OEM's have little appetite for something that doesn't progress beyond that. Because it's simply what, not worth the effort. You, 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 your engineers, people like me, we love it. But from a commercial point of view, you should never do that. Because there's simply no payback for all the extra effort of having work instructions and special control systems and special methodologies and what have you, or something like that. It simply does not pay. So realistically, there will be little appetite if we do not get smarter. And in that, we share uh, an overall challenge in offshore wind. And the overall challenge is that while the turbines kept on getting cheaper, the infrastru infrastructure did not. So when we built Vindeby, the turbines were a sig very significant proportion of the total cost. Now they are way less than half of the total capex. In other words, the turbines got to be a lot cheaper, the infrastructure did not. And if you look at the cost curves, I'm sure all of you have seen these uh, balloon plots or whatever they are called of how costs have gone in European offshore. Vindeby, uh, here, uh, Tune, uh, some, uh, um, Horns Ref, Nysted, all kind of going nicely down and then rups going up. So now the cost is like twice that of, of Vindeby when it comes to LCOE. And of course, it's part of it is simply because the subsidy system has allowed the continuation of practices that were not the most competitive. So to some extent, it is about uh, um, subsidy junkiness. It's simply, it, people do not optimize if they are not forced to. But it has to happen. Uh, so we need in industrialization. And um, when people list what you need, they tend to list all kinds of things. Industrialization is there, but it's also uh, in, in inventions and uh, creativity and blah, 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 blah. What really makes the difference is innovation and industrialization. In other words, it's not about the patents. It's about getting it done in an industrial, uh, industrialized manner. And we need to do that, otherwise we will end up becoming ourselves a niche. And that is even more true for floating. Because besides all the challenges of the ordinary offshore, we have the real and perceived risks. And the reason I spell it out as real and perceived is that we all know that there are real risks. But besides what we know, there are the risks that investors believe are there. And they may play a much bigger role than the risks we know are there. So it is about real and it's about perceived. So if you look at known floaters, and now I'm shooting torpedoes in the side of certain people in this room, I apologize for that, but I also think that we should be honest to ourselves. We tend to be heavy. We tend to still to rely on construction methods from oil and gas. We tend to have build times that are measured in months, sometimes longer. And if you look for the steel structures, we take care of hydrostatic pressure with braces. 
braces are always fillet welds. Fillet welds are poor fatigue curves. Then you have fatigue driving your design. And they typically run into tens of thousands of welding hours. And if we look at a concrete, it tends to be very high weight and the mobilization effort is high. In other words, you need dry dock, a real or, or classical or ex excavated in a beach and you need kind of special skid arrangements and so on. Specialized harbor, specialized arrangements. So what I basically say is that we need to do it differently. It could be fun if we could do a thousand ton foundation for a six megawatt. I would like to have a build time measured in weeks. It's not just about the area you take up that you pay for. It's also about how your investors look at you. What sort of rates they pay for money that is tied up for long times. And it could be fun as a target to say as a minimum we need to be at floater depths no more costly than fixed foundations. So how do you go about that? And I basically say let's look for inspiration. Let's look at an industry we can find out there who is known for doing this, who has a lot of experience in doing big structures fast and efficient. Who could that be? And I guess you know the answer. It's us. It's the onshore wind industry. The onshore wind industry is today the cheapest new capacity you can build. And they built the machines in the field in a matter of weeks. There was recently, a, or in this spring, a video from Mid-American showing the installation of a turbine. It takes them three weeks from a flat level piece of ground before there's even anything cast out there in concrete. From the first excavator moves in and until the turbine is operating, three weeks. So, and I would like to introduce you to a world champion that you may not know is a world champion, but it is. And it is the humble wind turbine tower. It has the lowest cost per kilo of any large steel structure in the world. You cannot buy the steel structure of an airport or a bridge or a ship for the cost you pay for a wind turbine tower. And the wind turbine tower on top of that has C5 high corrosion protection and it has wells that come into class C1 or D or something like that. In other words, it has very high class wells it has perfect surface protection, it's cheaper than anything else you can get. We manufacture 20,000 of them a year in the industry. And the reason for that is that we separated manufacturing and installation. And it's so trivial that we basically have forgotten it. But fundamentally, nobody told us that we would have to do like that. It could as well have been that we said, oh yes, we're building this 100 meter large structure you cannot transport a 100 meter structure, therefore we have to build a rolling painting welding facility out there where we built the project. It was even discussed regularly to do these mobile factories. We never do that anymore, we never discuss it. Because we have got used, so much used to it that we've forgotten that it was not kind of cast in stone, it had to be like that, that wind turbines are split, uh, wind turbine towers are split into sections so that they can be transported. We've forgotten that you could have done it in a different way. And that's because it's by far the most economical. Then it's standardized, and then, last but not least, which I find very interesting, there's no IP. When you go to a wind turbine tower manufacturer and look around, I, as a, as, as a technical person, can recognize a Siemens tower. But I cannot see which tower he otherwise has is GE or Vestas or whoever because they are fundamentally the same. So they do not compete on who has the smartest flange solution or smartest weld or whatever. They might compete a little on a door frame or on a bracket for the ladder or whatever, but they do not compete on the fundamentals because there's no IP. So the competition is all who can do it smartest, who can uh, most efficient when it comes to welding hours and rolling and painting and so on. That's where we need to be. So I've made a set of dogma I say keep it simple, manufacture components the onshore way, assemble it with onshore methods, onshore methods simply means bolting, launch, install, commission, to out, hook up, operate. Where you do your floating foundation needs to look like how you do uh, onshore turbines big time. You simply get equipment in, 
And I, I, I basically, that's why I call it a dogma. It's something you would say, we stick to this rule, no fabrication on site. No special processes, everything assembled by bolting. And then I say for engineering, minimize bending moments. Uh, no, uh, the only welds that are permitted are butt welds. No fillet welds, only butt welds. And then because we need to do it the, the onshore way, don't work with anything bigger than six meters diameter. Don't work with anything cast that's heavier than 40 tons. Don't want to lift anything that's more heavy than a thousand tons. Then you stay within the frame of onshore wind. And I have designed an example following that. It's a tetrahedral structure. It is composed completely of, of onshore equipment. Um, that is a cast node, hop technology. They are welded pipes, tower technology. Cast node, welded pipes, cast node. And in this picture here, fiberglass tanks, it could also be steel tanks. And since you need more buoyancy than you can have with a six meter tank, you solve it not by going to a bigger tank than six meters, but have by having more tanks. So that you still stay true and loyal to the dogma that says do it the onshore way. Um, and the way I deal with the braces is that I have no braces. So I simply apply an overpressure to the tanks. So they have a slight overpressure that's bigger than the hydrostatic pressure ever gets and then you don't need any braces, and then you can have a, have a thin walled tank, even a, in this case a fiberglass tank. It is a little cheaper with a steel tank, but, but it's kind of roughly the same. And fiberglass tanks are made big time for storage of, of liquids and solids in the industry in Denmark. It's very often preferred over, over um, steel tanks, and that shape is something you can go out and buy off the shelf. It's not called an offshore buoyancy tank, it's called a storage tank for something, but it's essentially the same thing. And such a concept is applicable to a semi sub or to a TLP, it's difficult to see it work with a spa. I'm sure it can be done, I've not thought much about it. I've just thought that also, in my world, the spa disadvantages are simply too big. I, I think that the idea that you, you can only assemble it in, in a deep water port is not attractive. And I think that if you do things like this, you actually do tackle those issues I started by saying are stumbling blocks to us. And what I'm doing here is of course not that I'm saying it has to be like this. I'm saying I'm trying to provoke the system, us here being the system, other people out there being the system say, well at least I think we could move the kind of target bar to a, a new and lower cost, but at least here's a way you could do it. And the benefits are there's no mobilization or low, because you can do the assembly on any flat level ground in a port. You don't need any special facility, just need it to be flat and close to the key side. And you get the, the double whammy of both low weight, because you had these no stringers, high, co high class welds, etc. And low cost per kilo. One euro fifty for the welded steel, to, uh, three euros for the cast parts, that's kind of ballpark figures because they are done the tower way and the hop way. I think we can do that 100-200 meter steps at cost similar to fixed foundations at 50 meters or maybe lower, which could be great fun. In doing this, I have a US angle on the design. Of course, I work out of Europe. I'm a Danish citizen. I live in, in, in my life in Denmark. But when it comes to actually doing this, um, I have needed partners, or at least a partner, because dialogue is always an essential part. We're having a dialogue here. And I don't have the competence. I'm not a hydrodynamic uh, calculation person. So I selected uh, Wintelect, which is, uh, some of you will know them, Kevin Jackson, Mike Sutek, Rick Santos. Mike is like me from the 70s in wind. Kevin is from the 80s, Rick is our rookie, he's from the 90s. Um, and they have simulated this thing. Um, and they've done that with, with fast, uh, using this, this, this version of the code. And here I have a remark, and I actually hope somebody would be here from DOE, 
where I say that it's crucial that FAST continues to be developed and maintained. I think that there are signs in, in the moon and sun that that might not be happening. It would be really bad. And these are the sorts of results you get out, a frequency spectrum. This is a plot of surge and yaw and then your tendon loads. Well, yaw doesn't matter. Fine. Uh, the wave heights here, <coughs> this is a 13.3 meter significant wave height simulation tendon loads on the, on the different parts. <coughs> Wonderful to work with clever people. I would never have got to where I am now if it had not been for somebody here being competent with FAST. And then I'm going to disseminate that or in, 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 in different levels. There are two levels of innovation. One is what I told you here. It is an innovative concept. I'm not saying that somebody has not thought, thought the thoughts already. If somebody has, perfect. Um, but at least it's a, it's a way where we try to take the um, inspiration from an industry that's good at industrializing and taking it on. But I'm also doing it a new way when it comes to dissemination because I want to do this as an open source, royalty free thing. So anybody who wants to use the IP that's in this can get it for free. And we hope to do a joint industry project and then I would like universities and research institutes to be involved in improving on it. And the basic statement is, here's, here's something, please outsmart me. Please do something that's smarter. And in this, I have been assisted greatly by DNVGL because they have agreed to conduct an independent review, which they're actually doing at the moment. They actually fund it themselves, which is, I mean, I'm truly grateful for. And um, they, are, they will do something that is called a verification of feasibility, which will be published uh, in the open source documents. And the next steps in this is that we will complete the design for North Sea conditions. North Sea conditions are pretty rough, 14.4 meters significant wave height. Around here you would have 11 point whatever. So a very rough condition. And then uh, there will be a, an infrastructure for an open source arrangement and then there will be an invitation for a JIP. And of course I will try for my part, the JIP is something that DNV will do, I'll try for my part to to uh, get involved with the research people to see if we can do something here. And it will all be launched in at the European Wind event in November. So great fun. I hope that this could form part of the basis of the discussion for the next few days. And um, if anybody would be interested in a dialogue, unfortunately I have to leave at the end of today. Please approach me later today and uh, we'll have a chat. So thank you. Thank you. I, I went through this uh, stat oil process. We looked at floating for many years. We looked at the likely costs and challenges, and, and I thought, yeah, come on. Then we had the catwalk. The way stat oil selected their partner was to a beauty contest. So they traveled the industry at the end of 2006 and, and looked at people, and we sat down and said, come on, it will never work, because commercially it can't be made to work. And there we had the experience that our preconceived beliefs about the costs were both right and wrong. So some things we thought would be very expensive, like anchors and so on, actually they were not that bad. And other things were abysmally bad, but where you started thinking, hmm, you could maybe do it in a different way. And then the next eye-opener was in 2009 about the press. And it was indeed very strange. We did, as I say, we announced this world's biggest project. We built huge projects. We did all kinds of things. And then all they were interested in was this silly one 2.3 megawatt turbine because it was floating. And there's a hmm, could be. And then gradually, quite frankly, I came to realize that if we want to do real big things on climate, in many places of the world you need offshore. You cannot do the, fill the energy gap with onshore wind and PV. And those places who need it don't always have the possibility to do offshore. So there's actually a gap, and this is what could fill the gap. And, um, and then f finally and fundamentally, 
On a personal note, when you leave after having been the technical manager of a company for decades as I did, uh, you do not start by going out and doing things that compete with what they do, because it's not fair to your old colleagues and to uh, and and you and, and a guy like me cannot sit down and rest. I could sit down and rest less than I thought I could. So when I when I when I kind of got engaged, I I, I said, let me do something here that is not conflicting with anything that Siemens does, and it actually serves. Their interests because floaters generally like lightweight turbines and Siemens turbines are lightweight turbines. So it kind of I'm kind of supporting my old bodies without infringing what they are doing. So that's the story of it. I think it's very important here to emphasize that I very explicitly do not speak keyside manufacturing. I only speak keyside assembly. I don't want anything that cannot be hauled in by truck. And that means that the whole logic is that if you are in Maine or in Massachusetts or wherever and there is a tower factory nearby that can work for you, why wouldn't you want to do that for, for PR reasons and so on? But you should never be dependent on it. You should never be in a position where you rely on the shipyard or something else to do it for you. That is a whole trick. That's what. That's how onshore wind works. You are not depending on a California manufacturer being there for your California project. You simply select the one that has the lowest total cost, landed cost, when it comes to manufacturing cost and transportation cost. That is how competition has worked. That is what brought onshore wind cost down as dramatically as it did. The, the, the main thing is that they need to see a perspective. If it's this niche of prototypes and demonstrators, you have very little appetite. You go in and do something with EDP in Portugal because you get a big onshore order tagged on to you doing a floater. We do a big thing with whoever because it's tagged up to something else. If it was only this, we wouldn't touch it with a hot end or a fire poker. So what we need to do, people in this room, uh, and, and others like us, is to create an ambience where the turbine supplier can see that there is indeed the prospect of a genuine market. And to be quite frank, and not shooting at anybody other than, I mean quite frankly, Mitsubishi. If you look at the Mitsubishi 6,000 ton floater, <laughs> I can tell you that no manufacturer who is worth his salt will look at that and say, oh yes, wow, that's a new market for me. No way. They need to see something where we, if, if we could Somebody could, could come out and say, here's actually, you know, actually the cost is like what you make your money on now. You, you Infrastructure cost like this now. Now, same cost, but just a bigger market. They will embrace it, I can assure you. Okay, I think that's my time. Thank you, yes. Rick.